2019. Please join me in a moment of silence. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Well, let's say tonight, it's glad to see everybody here. It's a fuller house than I thought we'd have tonight, but uh, we've got some good things on the agenda tonight. We're going to talk about school funding a little more. We're going to talk about trash. Seems like we can't get away from the trash can long enough to empty the trash, but uh, we'll, we'll get people up here to talk about trash and uh, see where we take that conversation. But uh, let's keep working together as a community. You know, it's all about, it's all about us working together to get where we want to get to, so let's, uh, let's keep the ideas flowing. I think... Uh, good perspective on different angles of these issues is what's important and we should talk about it in open public and uh, that's the way you solve problems and uh, if we do that right I think we'll get to where we want to get to uh, over the long haul so with that city manager uh, council I do want to bring uh, this to everyone's attention for the public more so than council uh, the first base side at uh, the baseball field will be shut down until further notice we've had some issues at, at that um, on some of those bleachers and for safety reasons we're going to shut that side of the uh, field down until we can have some engineers take a look at it and make a determination as to what we need to do in the future so uh, i'll keep everybody posted as we get some reports back from our engineers and we hope to get that back within the next couple of three weeks okay anybody council got a comment i, I would like to say i noticed uh, earlier today that uh, uh, jane sheffy had passed away and she had served the community in a lot of different capacities, one of which being the electoral board for many years. So uh, just keep her family in your prayers. Okay. Anything else? Um, I have a quick question um, <clears throat> or a comment. I know next week we're coming up on the 4th of July holiday and uh, it'll be Thursday. I know there'll be some great activities going on down uh, here, downtown in the park. Um, so it is a Thursday, and my question was, the office that I work in at my day job, it seems like anytime there's a holiday on a Thursday, and then coming up on the weekend, the day after the holiday, that Friday, is usually a day when not a whole lot gets done. A lot of people use that as a, you know, call in sick anyway to try to have a long weekend. So I think right now we're open, but uh, is there any way or discussion we can have uh, to just see if this is a good idea or not to just be closed on that Friday and give the employees an extra day off so they have a, a long weekend. The constitutional officers do have the fifth off. Uh, they have the fourth and the fifth off. So the, the governor, depending on when holidays fall, the governor of the state will usually uh, issue a holiday for state employees. But that's not, that doesn't apply for the rest of the city? It does not apply for the city, no. So he's asking, I think, for everybody, right? What, you're asking. what is what does everyone think about that? I'd be fine with it. I mean, I'm fine you know, with it. nice four-day weekend for everybody to get them out into the community, enjoy the activities, enjoy their family. I think it'd be fine. Yep, I'm fine with it. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. I think if we have done that in the past, I know we have around the Christmas holidays, so uh, I have no no issues with it. Okay, I'll I'll let the staff know that uh, they have a fifth off as well. Thank you all. All right. All right, first item is uh, matters to be presented by members of the public non agenda. We've got one person signed up, Larry Gardner. How are you doing? Good. This is a concerning property. Please state, state your name and your address. Larry Gardner, 615. Port Smith Avenue. Okay. This is uh, concerning the property that's adjoining to mine. I have talked to uh, city code enforcement. I talked to them last year. I didn't get nothing done. I've talked to them this year. Still ain't got nothing done. I, my personal self, I went out there and I've cut the grass probably three or four foot high. 
I was promised something to be done, and I've got nothing out of it. The lady that did own the property, she passed away Thursday night. But the people say they own it, this is in here. I got pictures that come from inside the house, nothing but trash, and now it's on the outside in the back. I'm getting their rats, uh, whatever. Something needs to be done. I was promised last year something to get done. It's not been done. I don't know why. We pay our uh, property taxes. And as far as I know, this uh, property here I'm talking about, there's several thousands of dollars back taxes. And I think part of it's going into a collection agency, or however y'all do it, and they still owe taxes from this year and from last year. Something needs to be done. I'm tired of the groundhogs, I'm tired of the rats, I'm tired of the mosquitoes. Uh, last year I was told by the code enforcement officer, which he's not there no more, he'd come up here his own personal self and cut the grass if he had to. Hey, I've not heard from him since. Okay. Well, thank you. See, manager, do you know anything about this piece of property? This is the first time I've heard about this piece of property. Uh, I'm actually sending an email right now to code enforcement to get an update to see what that situation is. And uh, Mr. Gardner, if you'll uh, come over here in a second, I'll get your phone number and be back in touch with you. Okay, I've got another one. We've got speeders on that street. I've hollered at them to slow down. What do I get? I get the finger. It's going to come one time or another, it's going to be an altercation there. I've talked to the police department. We have patrol out there. The only time I see them, there's something else is going on up in the neighborhood. Once in a while they come through there. Other than that, you know, I don't know what the deal is. Okay. Can we not have speed bumps put on that street? we got kids that play out there. Okay. All right, we'll look into that, too. Thank I you think. for letting us know that. And, you know, that's not the first time that property in the city has been brought up. I don't know if others see it, but we've had several properties around the city that people are abandoning their properties and just letting the grass grow waist high. And um, so we can't let properties go like that. So we need to be notified so we can clean them up. All right, that's the last sign up for non-agenda items. Um, city manager did hand me two changes for the regular agenda. Um, one is to add this closed session um, language for additional closed session uh, down where we have the other closed session. And, uh, and then to change on item four, take out the word taxable. So it should just say consider resolution regarding the issuance and sale of general obligation refunding bonds. Or taxable. <clears throat> so if you are okay with those changes, <laughs> then I'd like to have a motion in a second. So. I'll make the motion that we remove the word taxable from item number four and to uh, item number seven, the closed session. Uh, we add the language uh, also discussion concerning respective business or industry or expansion of existing business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the industry's interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community code 2.2-37-11-85. Okay, got a motion, Mr. Hartley. And Mr. Hartley, would you also agree to uh, add into that motion to um, item four to be read caption only? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. caption only, I'm sorry. I, I second. Add that. I second. All right, okay. got a motion, Mr. Hartley, on those two agenda item changes. Second, Mr. Wingard. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All right, please call the roll. Florida? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. All right, on to item one, consider public hearing of an ordinance to add section 14-11 to the city code pertaining to unlawful feeding of waterfowl in the city of Bristol, Virginia. I hereby open the hearing. Staff comment. Uh, Council, this is a, um, Mr. Slagle had, had brought this to my attention a month or so ago and as we had to advertise everything, uh, this is the first time for a public hearing on this matter. We have had numerous complaints and I think anybody that's been to our parks and ball fields has seen that the um, extraordinary amount of waterfowl excrement uh, throughout our ballparks and fields those, um, those facilities are used by children, they're used by the public in general, 
in Cumberland Square Park, just the one that I see the most often, just based on its location to my office, um, it's a very difficult park to be able to utilize for the public. So this ordinance here would make it unlawful to feed waterfowl anywhere in the city. Uh, we have certain ballparks and parks where we know there are people, but people are not feeding the waterfowl. We do not have a waterfowl problem at those par parks and ballparks. However, we do have problems at other parks, and mainly Sugar Hollow, Eastern Little League, or not Sugar Hollow, Cumberland Square Park, uh, Eastern Little League, and I think Central as well have uh, issues with waterfowl. So this ordinance here would just make it unlawful uh, for people to feed waterfowl, and there would be a <coughs> maximum of $50 fine. Okay. Uh, one person signed up for comment on item one. It's Michael Pollard. Thank you, gentlemen of the council. My name is Michael Pollard. I live at 101 Ashley Drive. I have three questions. One, uh, whether a study shows a clear and causative relationship between the, the feeding and the uh, abundant population at the location, or if it's coincidental that the ducks and people both like parks. Um, there are a lot of ducks and geese on Old Abingdon Highway in areas where there are no uh, parks right in the immediate vicinity for people to be feeding them, but there's still a lot of ducks and geese in those areas. Uh, and since I expect that you're probably not wanting to answer me right now, you're probably wanting to answer all these at one time, I'll go and an give my other two questions. Uh, the second one is whether a study clearly shows that a feeding ban resolves the problem. And the third one is whether uh, alternative solutions have been evaluated such as trapping, because there are a large number of ducks at the park. Um, and considering the news is full of articles on food insecurity, we could potentially uh, kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, um, because there are a lot of very well-fattened ducks, and I've seen them feeding on uh, insects that are already in the grass. And I'm not, I, with short of a um, valid study, I'm wondering if maybe we ought to consider some alternative solutions other than just not allowing people to have fun by feeding the ducks. Thank you. Okay. No one else signed up for public comment? You want to comment at all on that? I, I can if the council wants me to. Uh, the city has not conducted any studies. However, uh, I think it's shown uh, through various different uh, means that feeding these animals do, will attract them to certain locations and um, other localities across the Commonwealth of Virginia have enacted the same legislation to prevent people from feeding the animals so that they don't continue to come back. Um, I don't think there's a study that says this will rid us of the waterfowl problem by not feeding them. I think it's gonna, there's gonna have to be some other methods employed in the future, but I think this is the first step in correcting that problem. We have looked at other non-lethal non ways to um, get rid of it, to remove the geese. Um, you have to have a permit, uh, from my understanding, in order to move, remove these geese. Um, and that's something that can be done. I know um, there's other lethal methods that could potentially be used, but we'd have to get permission, I think, from federal authorities and state authorities to do that as well. But that's not an avenue that we want to take immediately. Okay. All right, I hereby close the hearing. All right, on to item two. Consider first reading of an ordinance to add new city code section 50-177, overnight <coughs> recreational development standards, revise existing section 50-109B and section 50-123B, and add definitions to section 50-28, staff report. Mayor and council members, this is coming back to you um, from your last meeting that was tabled and uh, there were a couple questions raised and uh, so it just so happened the Planning Commission was meeting um, on the 17th and so I brought up your concerns that were raised to them and they um, considered those and of course theirs is just a recommendation back to you all um, at any other changes you all can make as a as an elected body but um, on the um, size limitation um, we did actually, after you looked at the maps, uh, the zoning maps, and I think there was some concern about smaller 
areas uh, or smaller, um, closer to residential where our B3 is because uh, remember the proposed ordinance uh, allows campgrounds in a zone, which is out here, most of this is Sugar Hollow Park. There's some property behind Sugar Hollow Park that's privately owned. And then the B3, which is um, the red that's outlined, and there's B1 that's also here that's a little hard to see. So we uh, had Kelly Miller, our GIS coordinator, took um, our mapping and did everything that is B3 zoned, that is at least two acres, shows up here and then we also broke that he broke that down into uh, over two acres so two to five acres or five to ten and over blue being over ten so you can see that um, really there's only two tracks th that two tracks well this is along a corridor but most of all our B3 zoning is is along major corridors Gate City Highway here and of course by exit five and seven there's a couple little spots that are um, in the two to five acres. Almost all this property is is developed, or um, so, or close to develop, or adjacent to developed land. Um, we also even looked at just taking that out and looking um, down at the just just different maps to show the the uh, tracks that are different sizes that are all zone B3. Um, so after looking at these maps and um, just thinking about in general what would make a good development, the Planning Commission is recommending this change um, that the two acre minimum be 10 acres, although allowing for if appropriate in an appropriate location it could be less than 10 acres, so, uh, but more than two acres through the special exception permit process, which requires public hearing and notification of property owners. Um, so also to point out that the way it's worded, it is a total contiguous area, so it could be potentially, you know, two five acre lots that are adjoining each other to make 10. Um, so th that's the recommendation. They also, um, uh, can, uh, I, um, Talk to them about the concern about the occupancy, um, duration of occupancy, and the discrepancy with the, what our policy is in Sugar Hollow Park. The ordinance proposed has 60 day uh, maximum in any 12 month period. Our policy in Sugar Hollow is 30 days. Um, read it exactly what it says. But they felt like um, they didn't want to. They didn't think that would be necessary to change. That any public or private camp a campground could have um, could have a more stringent um, requirement on the length of stay. Sugar Sugar Hollow campground rules are the maximum length of stay is 30 days per calendar year, with a maximum stay of 14 consecutive days at any given time. But again, that coming back to you, the recommend re recommendation is um, this change here, but no change on the other matter. About the duration because they felt like that's a matter of policy for any campground owner to be more stringent like we are with Sugar Hollow Park. Okay. What's the pleasure of council on this item? I make a motion uh, for the first reading of the ordinance by caption only. Okay, got a motion, Mr. Farnham, by caption only. I have a second. Um, I'll go ahead and make a second. But I'd like to have a little bit of discussion, too. Okay, I got a second, Mr. Hartley. All right, council discussion. Yeah, uh, um, so if I understand this, we're saying if it's 10 acres, they can do it by right. If it's less than 10, between 10 and 2, they could get a special exception. Is that what? Correct. To me, that, that minimum of 2 s still seems too small. I mean, I would assume maybe 3 or 4, well, probably 4, because when you look at it, it even 25% of the thing has to be setbacks and stuff. So, uh, you know, I just 
I still think two is too small, even with a special exception. Well, I was wondering why you didn't need to have that language anyway. So if you come in and you're going to want to put something under 10 acres, you're going to have to get a special exception anyway. So why would you even need that language in there? Why couldn't it all just be stricken out and just say, there shall be a minimum total contiguous lot area of 10 acres for any development period. <coughs> and if it's less than that, you got to get a special exception. It's like you do anything else, right? <coughs> so I don't know why we have to say that. That was my question. And I still, uh, I've got a little bit of problem with the 60 days. I mean, I don't yeah. know how y'all feel. I just, I just, if Sugar Hall is 30 with 14, that, that seems reasonable to me. For most people that's going to camp, 60 seems a little excessive. <coughs> So I don't know why we'd be inconsistent with Sugar Hall and, and the, you know, private. So that's just where I, that's just the way I'm thinking. Well, there's there's no requirement that you have that language in there that's in red. So I mean, if someone wants to do it in a, uh, a smaller lot, just like you say, they can come and apply for the special exception. Right. So what do we want to do? Do we want to? <clears throat> table this to send this back for further consideration? No, I, well, I mean, they've already looked at it and recommended it. I think we just need to act on it. Okay. I mean, uh, so you're, I mean, the, to the mayor's point, is there a reason that you need that language in there or they can't just go through the special exception process that we know if? Well, I, I, I added that language just from the verbal motion that was made. The Planning Commission didn't word that out to me, but that's what my understanding was to clarify, because normally, normally a special exception is based on use and not yard area type requirements, and so it's a little bit different maybe, but um, it, I think their, their understanding was if you, had something less, it would have to, it could come back through special exception process. And I added that wording because I thought it would possibly need it. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I don't mind the word, but I, two acres, the bottom of two seems way too small. Too I mean, you know, where that should be, like say four, I don't know, if you fit five. I mean, I don't really, you know, looking at the map, they looked at Put that five map back up. up again, where it had a five to 10, didn't it, didn't it have green? So the next map eliminates all the two to five and it's just five to ten, five, five and over. So what is that green up there near? Is that exit? Um, is that exit five right there? That the, this is no, seven. The this that, is five. This yeah, that, is the falls. That green near five. Is that where um, the, the ball corporate or the Huff. American merchant is? What is that? That's right. Huff Cook. Over that's there, that the other side of the creek. I can't be, tell from here. Yeah, that's, that's what like I'm thinking. That. It's that land behind there, you On know, the where I'm talking about where there's silos. Of yeah, that's what it looks like. Oh, I think this land right here is behind Settler's Life in there. Yeah, that's okay. what he's talking about. Settler's yeah. <laughs> Life. Well, you knew what it was. Yeah. Yeah, so, so five's not too awful bad. I mean, two's, two doesn't make sense, but five would be okay, I think. But you really don't need the language, so. All right, so we got a motion, a second. What do we want to do? So if the language is not in there about the two acres, it would just be if it's less than 10 acres, regardless if you have one acre or nine acres, you have to come in and apply for a special use, special mm -hmm. exemption permit. Yep. And whether it's one or nine or whether that language is there or not, they'll still have to get approval one way or the other, correct? If it just says a contiguous lot area of 10 acres for any development, hard stop. So even if it's nine acres, they got to come in, whether that language is in there or not, that extra language. You wouldn't be able to do it, yes, unless there was a special exception. Yeah. So I would be okay to amend my motion to, um, for the first reading, of the ordinance uh, without the wording, striking through the wording, uh, but a minimum of two acres may be considered through the ex special exemption permit process. 
Does that yeah. make sense? So you're saying to amend your motion and strike through the language from a proposed, everything in red, basically, from a proposed all the way to the end of the sentence? Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. I'm all right with that. And you want to consider amending your motion to change the length of stay? The length of stay? Um, yeah, because right now it stands, they, they brought it back with 60, so. I'm personally okay with the 60, but you know, you, both of you said you prefer something shorter, and we have 30 currently in Sugar Hollow? We have 30 in Sugar Hollow, and I mean, kind of like the mayor said, I'd be more comfortable with 30 because my understanding is the impetus is on the RV park or the development to, to police this for the most part. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that 30 would be a more reasonable amount of time for someone who's legitimately camping, you know, and, and because once you get to 60, it, it all of a sudden becomes very near permanent, you know, it becomes semi-permanent at that mm -hmm. point. And it does make sense to um, sort of follow along the lines of what we currently have in place at Sugar Hollow. So, you want to read the Sugar Hollow um, length of stay again one more time? Maximum length of stay is 30 days per calendar year with maximum stay of 14 consecutive days at any given time. But the 14 days at any given time, that's, that's just our policy. I mean, what, I don't know. So in Sugar Hollow, you could be there 14 days and you could <clears throat> pick up and move a day and come back and stay another. <laughs> 16 days, I guess, right? Or 14 days, and you pick up and come back another two days, right? That's the way that works. Right. What did you say, Bill? Oh. Uh, I was just saying that, that I didn't see, a, it was just a total per year. It didn't have length of stay in here. Yeah, this was just 60 days per <coughs> calendar. Yeah. So. So I'd say the 14, the 14 days at a time is just, just our, just our rule that we're following. So. I mean, I'd be I'd be cool with you know, 30 days per calendar year for, for this ordinance. So that way, it's even across the board, and we're not giving either Sugar Hollow, <clears throat> Sugar Hollow, or any kind of new development any kind of advantage over the other one. You know, that way they're both on the same playing field. So I guess what you're saying, if you okay. adjust your motion to 30 days, one calendar year, and strike that. Yes. So I would like to amend my motion with two changes. The first change, striking through the wording about uh, if the proposed development is less than 10 acres, um, having the wording in there about the special exemption permit process. And then the other change, the second change would be changing the um, number of days, length of stay from 60 to 30. And I'll still second that. Okay, so that's an amended motion. So to clarify, so it's 30 days in one calendar year, just like Sugar Hollow reads for this ordinance, and it's only the black 10 acres, everything else is struck from the language. Okay. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. Please call the roll. Fordham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Lincoln? Yes. Abstain? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you all. <clears throat> All right, so you want to read by caption only? Yes, please. <coughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, creating regulations addressing overnight recreational development, an ordinance amending Article 2, zoning of the city code for Bristol, Virginia, creating the new section 50-177, overnight recreational development standards under Division 10, supplemental regulations in addition to adding definitions under section 50-28, and revising and adding overnight recreational development as a permitted use section in section 50-109 and 50-123. All right, thank you. All right, on item three, consider first reading of an ordinance to amend chapter 70 of the city code relating to collections. Staff report. Well, let's talk trash, and while I do that, I'm going to go up here to the podium this time. <clears throat> Council, uh, I know we sent this out on Thursday, and as we continue to look through it, you can see it's relatively uh, uh, tedious in how we 
have to explain everything in regards to these trash ordinances. Uh, I do have some changes that I want to outline and we can just go through those real quick. Section 70 hyphen 21, that's under residential collection, waste collection. Um, talked to several council members today in regards to that. We understand that there are numerous residents in the city who have a um, second can. They purchased that second can previous to us making any decisions on moving forward with how we're updating our solid waste ordinances. And when they purchase those cans, the agreement between the citizen and the uh, purchaser and the city was the fact that if they purchase the can, the can would be picked up for free. Uh, the second can would. So uh, several council members have suggested that we add language to this ordinance that would say that cans were, that were bought on or before July 1 of 2019 will not be charged the second can fee. Any second can, um, any purchase after July 1 would be subject to the uh, second can fee. So, does anyone have any, and I'm just kind of looking at this as a Well, that's the way it should be. If, they, if the agreement originally was they buy the can, it's theirs, right. and we pick it up, we need to honor that. And it, it wasn't spelled out anywhere that I'm aware of, and I don't know, I guess it was just some policy or something. I'm not exactly sure where that came from, but it wasn't spelled out in the ordinances, but we'll clearly spell it out this time. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure why they did it that way, but if that's the way they did it, I agree. We should honor it. Uh, the other thing that, to make sure it's spelled out, I think I mentioned to you, I don't know if it's in the appendix, but the fact that if you do need a second can temporarily, you, ha you can request one, that that needs to be spelled out as well. Okay. Uh, I know that's the current policy. I th you, can, you can request one for like one week. And, and I think you can do that once a year or something. So uh, people, that needs to be spelled out to avoid these kind sure. of things. So you wanna go through an example so everybody kind of gets sure. what you're saying? Um, well, for example, I know there's a couple of citizens sitting in here right now. They have two cans, uh, maybe more cans. And they purchased those cans years ago. So based on the way we're going to change this ordinance, if we do not make the change that I just discussed, they would be getting charged $33 per can. But now with this change, since they purchased those cans prior to July 1 of 2019, Ms. Hunt will only be charged the $33 even for two cans. Um, but however, if she were to purchase a third can after July 1 of 2019, she would be charged a second can rate for that third can. It's, that, and that's specific to her. I know so she's here. Is this here. a one-time thing or is this every month going forward for the additional can? It's a, it's a monthly fee. so. Right. It's a thirty-three dollars a month. So, so it'd be, if you have two cans, it's sixty-six dollars a month. But she's. 16 and a half. Oh, I'm sorry, sixteen and a half. Sorry. But to add to that, should she decide to clean out her house and say, I, I, "I'm, I'm clean, doing some house cleaning. I need an extra can. Can you bring one over for one week?" That yes, would be and we and we currently do that. If they and, call and say, yeah. hey, "You know, I need a can for a couple of weeks," we do that and take it out to them and then pick it but, up. But on a continual, ongoing basis. Correct. Okay. So, and I guess the other thing I need to add is, as I go through these changes and we discuss them, whenever you do the motion, I would just suggest that you um, do the motion and add the changes that we've discussed here, if I see a consensus on that. I do have a question on, sure. on that. So, so anyone who has purchased a second can before July 1st of this year right. only gets charged with one can. That's correct. So, so say they bought one in 2013 and they've had it for six years, seven years and it, it breaks. So if they have to get a replacement can, does that lift them out of that grandfathered status for only being charged for one? I would say that it does not lift them out of that grandfathered status simply because they had an agreement with the city back in 2013 that they would be picked up for free. Okay. <clears throat> and am I hearing that we are gonna let people purchase that second can from now to July 1? Well, the way the ordinance would read would be as of July 1 of 2019, because okay. you can't make the ordinance retroactive because this won't pass until July 9th. So we can make it retroactive to July 1. Or you can wait and say until July 10th. Um, that's pleasure, the pleasure of council, but I just figured for fiscal year purposes and 
cutoff times, July 1 was the appropriate time to do that. So I think what he's saying is, you know, so if we pass it, there's going to be a lot of people maybe well, and there, and we may, coming right. by now. They may be coming and buying now. And that, that would still be legitimate. Right. right. How many do you have in inventory? <laughs> maybe not enough. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not enough. I was going to say you're going to have a rush on cans, but I don't, I don't hold that thought. I don't know. All right. Next okay, change. so the next change would go over to section 7022. And that section, it's section E. It conflicts with 7026, so I would suggest we strike that. Strike E entirely? Yes. And I'll tell you why, because once we get to 7028, um, and then I think there's another section, Basically what we've done, we've changed the language that we will be picking up basically any waste within the city unless it has been produced by a contractor. Uh, if it's a contractor and a permit has been pulled, then the contractors want to be responsible for removing that waste from the city or from the site. So we would strike uh, Section E. 7024 is the exemption for elderly and disabled persons. We have added language that states um, if an applicant's income is at or below the current federal poverty guidelines, then uh, they would be eligible for the exemption. There has been a discussion about instead of leaving it at $10 a month to change it to 33% of whatever the current rate is. So one third of $33, that would increase to $11. Uh, and if rates continue to rise over time, their rate would increase proportionally to whatever the increase rate is. Uh, I know I had the discussion with a couple of council members today at lunch. So I don't know how the other three feel about that. So your language change is to change that $10 to 33%? It would 33% of whatever the uh, normal residential waste collection rate is. So right now it's thirty three dollars, so it'd be eleven dollars. That's correct. Ten. And if it goes up to thirty six, it would be twelve. Thirty nine, it'd be thirteen. Yeah, I'd, I'll just add. I mean, the, I'm glad to see that in there because that's one of the major concerns uh, we've heard about. You know, uh, elderly and and particularly elderly on fixed income that that would be in poverty. So this changes that, makes more people I think would be eligible. <laughs> Uh, but the way it's set is it uses a floating definition, the federal guidelines. So over time, that definition will change. Before, it was a fixed amount, but we haven't changed the, the amount of uh, the rate, make it a variable rate so that if, if things change over time, we don't have to go back and, and go through a public hearing and all that to, to change the ordinance, that it just kind of will change over time. But I think that's a one-third of the uh, rate is a pretty fair discount for, for elderly citizens who are in poverty. And I'd say a lot of people still maybe don't know about that. People have been paying 22, now they're gonna be paying 33. They may actually be eligible to pay 11. So yeah. that's, I think that's a good yeah. and, program and the, that we have. Yeah, and the way this is written, if I understood the, the way it was currently, you, you had to apply like in May and this doesn't have a date on it. So, I mean, if you turn 65 in October or something, you, you can go to the Commissioner of Revenue and, and just do it whenever throughout the year. There's not one That's the deadline. So, so I think it makes it easier for people to participate. And, mm -hmm. and uh, again, it's something we need to make sure people know about. Okay. Um, the next item that would be changed is 70-28, and this deals with um, debris or construction waste or uh, demolition waste. We would strike the entire section B. Did you say B or D? B, B is in Bravo. That would uh, require the city to pick up any waste that is left uh, out by a resident as long as it is not uh, waste is generated by a contractor and in order to do that we would add a sentence to item C of 7-28 
that states no bulk waste shall be collected from houses or other structures under construction, reconstruction, recently completed, or being demolished that is being conducted by a licensed contractor within the city. And then they would also be subject to a class one misdemeanor. I think that makes sense. If it's out there, we, we pick it up. Well, I think we've talked about that before as far as we offer a high level of service already, picking up leaves, grass clippings, bulk pickup, like your couch or your refrigerator. So <coughs> there were times when it was questionable if, if we were picking it up, if it was over or under a certain weight or cubic feet. So I think it makes sense that, you know, our residents pay the fee, so, I mean, we pick it up. <coughs> I have a question while we're on 70-28. Uh, sure. So taking out C or taking out B, A and C seem to cover basically anything that doesn't go in a trash can, right? So what is item D? It says additional waste not meeting the above conditions will not be removed. What? That's basically what could a catch-all unless okay. I misunderstand it. It's basically a catch-all. So somebody just parks their Volkswagen out next to the road that they won't they won't pick it up. Okay. Depending on what type it is, I mean, <laughs> it's a Jetta collector's edition. It's a Jetta. It's so, just leave it. It's a Jetta. Leave it. so, with the scrappers we have in the city, that engine block <laughs> won't be there when our trucks roll through. <laughs> Probably won't have to worry about it too long. No. I did neglect. Um, it's seventy hyphen eight. I'm sorry, seventy hyphen seven. We had a section E in that section. That needs to be deleted completely. Did you say D? E is an echo. 70 hyphen 7 E. I'm not showing an E on mine. I, it's because, that's the updated version that I've given you all. So the okay. one that's in the packet is an E and that needs to be deleted. And the next change is over to 70 hyphen 58. I wanted to show an example of what some people do within the city that has been brought to my attention. As you see here, this is right here on Euclid Avenue, right at the intersection of Piedmont and Euclid. As it stands right now, there's nothing illegal with the way that brush is being kept and put on the street. And there's nothing illegal in the new ordinances that, or that would make that illegal. Um, and I know that's been a concern amongst council members and citizens of having brush in the street. But if you can look where their yard is and the, even the neighbor's yard down right down the street, there's really not a place that our boom truck can pick that up unless it's sitting right there in that location. It's not a travel lane. It's a parking lane. So it's not impeding traffic. Um, it's not leaves which would go into the storm drain or, drain or grass. The boom truck, trying to pick it up off the hill, uh, I don't know if the boom would reach that far to get that. Uh, it'd be close, depending on where they would put it in their yard. But I get a lot of complaints from residents about things such as this, but it's not illegal to put it where it's at. Um, so what we are making illegal is putting grass and leaves in the street because those get washed into the storm drains, which clog up the storm drains. So I just wanted your all's thoughts on how you want to deal with a situation such as this, because as of right now, there's nothing wrong with what, what this resident has done. <clears throat> okay, this, is, this area right here in the city is unique in itself because <clears throat> this right here, by all rights, is not in the street right this is side parking along the street and then they have a grass area and a sidewalk right there's no other place for them to put their debris for a boom truck to take on the liability to try to reach over in the yard 
and knock down that wall on a mishap, we, we can't be doing that. The concern is the brush, leaves, and grass in the streets where vehicles travel. This area here is not where vehicles travel. This right. is parking. That's, that's my concern is debris in the street. It's and especially dangerous for motorcycles, right? It is dangerous for motorcycles. And I know there was an issue last year with uh, a citizen who was riding through a subdivision and came across a, a hill that's a blind hill. And as they crossed the hill, there was a grass blown in the middle of the street. And if they would have went into the opposite lane of traffic, they could have had a head-on collision with a vehicle. So, um, and I agree with you, Mr. Wingard, that, you know, Really, that's not the problem. Where we really hear a lot of problems are some of these smaller streets, the alleys, where um, there's really not any place for some of those folks to put anything either, except maybe part of it's in the street. And what we'll do in the future is make sure that people are aware that it cannot be in the street. Uh, I can't say that it's going to be perfect. There's going to be some uh, growing <coughs> pains that we have as we go through this new process, not only for city staff, but for residents to understand exactly what can and cannot be done. But for the most part, we're opening up everything that if a citizen wants to throw it away, we're going to pick it up. Uh, what we don't want to happen are people putting things in the street thinking we're just going to pick it up and there's not going to be any consequences to suffer because it is illegal to place items in the street. And I would add language to section 70-58 that states it shall be unlawful to allow placement or accumulation of leaves on a sidewalk or an area that pedestrians would be expected to walk on parallel to a public street or a median strip within an eligible public right-of-way or any other street is the language that I would add to that. Well, you didn't have any language in there concerning a vehicle, a motorized vehicle. You, you covered pedestrians walking to where it can't be on the sidewalk. Well, a street, you know, any street if it's in a lane of travel because it talks about um, pedestrians to be expected to walk parallel to the public street or a medium strip or the street. And, you know, it just cannot be in a street. That's really a travel lane. That's not necessarily the street. Okay. You could say or any other street designated for vehicular traffic. You know, just, just to be clear about that. Could you, could you not use this public right of way? Well, that, that's a public right, right of way, that parking right there. So oh, okay. we'll just, we'll leave it as designated just, for vehicle traffic. Okay. Because I was just thinking. Or within the lanes of travel. That would cover a street or an alley. Right. Or, or, but, yeah. And item C under that same section is more of a definition. is what we've considered bulk waste, and we probably just need to add bulk waste is considered furniture or appliances, and add that language is considered. Is that under 7060 or what? Uh, no, 70 hyphen 58 C. It says yard waste shall not be placed over near any storm sewer inlet. Okay, and then you've also got uh, additional um, under 7059 that defines where tree limbs and things should be left and actually uh, what you all are looking at is 70 half 59 70 half and 60 I was looking at the old section so that that explains in detail what someone can and can't do in regards to tree trunks branches shrubbery and it defines uh, bulk waste and then we do have a limitation on an item that weighs more than 300 pounds uh, that cannot be picked up by city crews, and that's mainly for uh, city employee uh, benefits so that they don't get hurt. So, um, with that in 70, I guess 70, 60, where it says bulk waste, that new portion, would all the, the things about placement, for example, uh, everything about I mean, placements would still apply. So, so you could. Like if they had a, a couch, they would set the couch right there because they correct. couldn't. I mean, it'd be the same place right. you put all that. 
out of the road, but where a truck could pick it up. That's correct. Okay. I know we talked about this a little bit, but if um, we were talking about the leaves, if the leaves are the worst, um, you know, middle of October to the, you know, first week in November, and there's a lot of leaves out there, is there anything we can do with staffing and scheduling, such as, you know, in January, February, and March, there may not be any leaves or grass clippings to well, kind of double up on the, <coughs> the busy time of the year? To Mr. McCulloch and I, we've had this discussion ongoing now probably for about six weeks. Uh, it's my opinion we need to find a way, and financially it may not be feasible, but we need to find a way to run crews basically 12 hours a day from April through October. Um, I get more calls and waste more time on phone calls in regards to trash, leaves, and brush than I do anything else in the city. And it tells me one of two things. One, we've got a lot more gr grass, leaves, and brush than what we think we do and we're not properly staffed or have the proper equipment to handle it in a tiny, timely manner. Or two, which I don't believe is necessarily the case, our staff isn't working the way that they should, should work because I do believe our staff is working as hard as they can to get this stuff done. For example, we did a, we called over to Bristol, Tennessee and just did a comparison <laughs> as the type of equipment they have uh, for waste collection as compared to what we have. When it comes to the sidearm, um, trash trucks, they have, and we did it per resident, they have basically three sidearm trash trucks to our two sidearm trash trucks per resident. The rear loader, they each, we each city has one rear loader uh, trash truck. The boom truck, which is what's gonna be used to pick up this and refrigerators and a lot of the bulk waste that we're talking about, the city only has two boom trucks Bristol, Virginia does, and the city of Bristol, Tennessee has told us they have six boom trucks. And in regards to leaf trucks, which are the vacuum trucks, they uh, have three leaf trucks and we have two. So can I argue if we had more trucks it would be picked up any quicker? I don't want to make that argument just yet. I think an analysis needs to be done to determine, one, can we run our routes better? We will have some software here shortly that will allow us to analyze our routes to see if those routes can be run a little bit better. Uh, two, I think uh, Bristol, Tennessee, in regards to grass clippings, requires the grass clippings to be placed in plastic bags for pickup, and they do not use the leaf trucks during to pick up grass like we do. They only use the leaf trucks to pick up leaves, you know, September, October, November. Um, so that may be something we need to look at in the future if we want to require residents to put those in plastic bags. The problem when you put those in plastic bags, you're putting them back into the landfill. Um, so it's a six of one and half a dozen of the other as to what we need to do with that. But those, those are just some of the numbers. I think, honestly, uh, as we go through this process, uh, citizens need to understand that we're trying to learn and do it as quickly as possible too as to how things get picked up uh, and it's going to take us some time to get everything down to a science but I intend on getting it down to a science and if I can financially find a way to make it work I want to have crews working longer hours from April through October in order to handle handle these issues so that our citizens uh, can keep their place clean it's just that simple. We want to have a nice city for people when they come through and when you drive through and you see brush sitting out for a week uh, or trash sitting out or uh, boards and, you know, household waste, it, it's not very attractive for people when they're coming into the city. So we've got to do better about that and I think we will get better. All right, so I got a question from an attorney standpoint. So based on, these are a lot of changes. This to me is pretty substantial, all the right. changes. So. Uh, I don't think that warrants us doing anything more than taking this back for revision to come back and do another first reading because of the number that. of changes that you, you've got. Council would just need to table it. We cannot make a motion with the uh, <clears throat> said recommendations and get the first reading. I, I mean, I think we're all pretty well in agreement. With well, I think so. I didn't hear a lot of disagreement, so. So is that allowed based on the number of changes? Later? Yeah, I, I think it's allowed based on the number of changes it's, made. It's yeah. between the first and second reading it's, where yeah, you can't make substantial. Right. 
Oh, and, it's between the first and second. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because we've had the public hearing and and we've heard and so. All right. So is that all the changes from the city manager's office? That's all I have, and uh, okay. I'll take any changes that I haven't gone over or talked to anybody about that we may not have covered. All right. We got a number of people that signed up for public comment, um, so I guess we need to hear from them before we. Sure. Move on. And I, I hope tonight, I hope was informative to the public so that they know what we're doing. I know we've had a lot of calls about it, wanting to know how we're going to fix it. So hopefully um, any of the concerns they have tonight have already been addressed. And if they haven't, we can look at that as well. Okay, first uh, person is Jack Johns. Hi, I'm Jack Johnson. I live at 209 Sunrise Street. Uh, my concern is scheduling and when I'm picking up stuff. And these are the top excuses I get. We've got people on vacation. I don't have enough help. Uh, and and all the trucks broke. And when do we, what day are we supposed to put our stuff out? In my case, it's Monday, Tuesday, Friday, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, I'm picking up grass. Why, we've got two trucks. Why can't they run their routes per the ordinance? On my, my case is on Tuesday. My grass should be picked up, my brush should be picked up in trash on Tuesday. Not Friday, not Monday. And you know, I, if a truck's broke, I see. If you're not picking it up Monday, pick it up on Wednesday, the next day. Don't wait three weeks to do that. I don't mind paying these rates, but I do have a problem with service. Because I like to put it out there, as you say, I, will use it. I like to put it out maybe the day before, mow the yard, put it out there, and get it picked up. It's not laying there for a week. And I think that's a reasonable expectation of citizens. I mean, you know, if, if we're going to have a requirement that you put it out the day before we pick it up, I think it's reasonable that citizens expect to be picked up the next day. Yeah, but it's not happening. And I, and I understand that. And, you know, we've had numerous discussions about that. Yeah. And, we're working through those problems, and I'm going to find a solution to it if it's yeah, one of the yeah. last things I do here. Yeah, but you know, it's the same excuse as trucks broke. Somebody's on vacation. I don't have enough help. Well, and you know, we've got six, eight, six drivers. We've got eight, eight drivers. We used to have 14. Right. So I mean, yeah. and that makes a difference. And literally, I mean, I hate to say it publicly, but we don't have some of the best equipment. It just breaks down. It's old and. Mm -hmm. When you have when you have one vacuum truck go down, that leaves you with one. Yeah, but you and, don't have wait three weeks before you come and pick it up. Well, and I agree with you on that. I, d I don't disagree with you at all. Okay. Well, that's my concern. Like I said, I don't mind. You know, you tell me what day you want it out there. I'll make sure it gets there the day before. And that would take care of this problem on Euclid if it was on schedule, some kind of schedule. There's and, no schedules. And I'm not disagreeing at all. I want to find a solution to it. Okay. I'd like to also thank Michael Main for coming out the other day and clearing up right away for us and I sure do appreciate it. Mike, you call Mike and tell him you need something done, he generally gets right on it. Right. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. All right, Michael Pollard. Thank you, gentlemen of the council. My name is Michael Pollard. I live at 101 Ashley Drive. A lot of the, uh, I sent some recommendations to the city manager by email. Um, by any chance, were those passed or communicated? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, okay. Uh, he resolved a lot of my issues. The main one that was, was left outstanding is the discrepancy between 22A and 26. 22A specifies that household garbage must be placed in plastic bags. 26 specifies that garbage must be bagged and enclosed in paper or plastic materials. Uh, personally, I like using paperboard boxes to put trash in, provided it's a small box that'll fit in the container, because that's a recyclable material. It'll, it'll decompose rather quickly in the landfill. Plastic bags won't. Um, and currently there is that discrepancy. One way or the other, they need, uh, in my opinion, they need to be consistent. Um, then uh, in 70-58, the code specifies a maximum size, uh, a twig size larger than a pencil. And I think that there should be a size specified because pencils come in a wide variety of sizes. Uh, a lot of millennials don't know what a pencil is anyway. 
um, if, if that intends to be a quarter inch diameter, a half inch diameter, just specify what that diameter is rather than referencing something that is not defined in the code. And um, that result, that was my only two outstanding issues. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, Renee Hunt. Hello, my name is Renee Hunt, 20 Jackson Lane, Crystal, Virginia. And I came tonight again to complain on trash. Um, I'm tickled I'm only paying $33. <laughs> However, the quality, since y'all first started this budget going up on the trash thing, the quality is horrible. They knocked my trash can down, spilled the trash out. That's okay, I can pick it up. The slop, I can't. So the slop is on my gravels. And in order to get the slop up, I have to shovel my gravels. Well, I'm not going to do that because the city don't pay for my gravels. I do. Um, Whitney Omni asked me to please speak on her behalf. She has four trash cans that she said hadn't been picked up in two weeks. She's got four kids. She lives behind the ball field off of Valley Drive. Um, she said they knocked her trash cans down. Trash is down the bank. I mean, um, and this is over in our area, uh, Mr. Hartley. Um, there was another, Doodle Davis's, uh, Doodle something's uh, mother. Same thing, trashes went by her house, didn't pick it up for two weeks. Um, I mean, you know, guys, we're, we're increasing our, 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 what we're paying for trash, but the quality has, in the last couple of weeks, has went down. I have called. And, and it's not fun when you have to talk to somebody on the other line that's rude. Excuse me, you work for me because you're doing me a service. I'm paying for that service. I don't need to speak to somebody rude and, and, and hateful. Come and pick up my trash. Um, I've had to call so many times to tell them. And Mike, Mike that drives the um, um, truck, not a trash truck, but a, uh, a regular pickup truck, he has even come to my house and emptied my trash in the back of his pickup truck that works for the city. I mean, this, this is unbelievable, the, the amount of hassle you're going through on the trash. Um, Monday, there was two trash trucks that run down my private drive, and both of them had the claw. And I was like, wow, trash man's here early. It's only 10 o'clock. I didn't get my trash. Went on back down, didn't get nobody's trash. But then the second truck that come in the afternoon, they picked up all the trash. Why, why would you double run a trash can? I mean, I know they run one for big objects that certain guys work on a trash truck that pick up big objects first before the cloud truck comes out and gets stuff. But these were both the same, uh, not the same truck, but they both had the same uh, crawl, uh, claw, whatever it's called. Um, that's a waste of money. I mean, you know, why didn't the first one pick them up? instead of just big objects. So anyway, I'm just, I'm just real upset about the trash and the quality and somebody is really getting laxed on the job of, of not getting on their guys or whatever. And I, listen, I love trash men. I know a bunch of them. Um, and we, sometimes I even wave and speak or whatever, but um, it's getting bad it, it, all over, especially in, in, in our area, Mr. Hartley. I can't speak for nobody else's area because I only see what, you know what, Mary Street, there's two trash cans, three right there going up West East Mary Street. No trash can lids on there. And, and it's still out there at the street. Thank you. Could, All right, next, uh, can Sandy I, Oliver. Oh, yeah. uh, can I make a comment? Sir? Sure. Uh, I was just to say, <clears throat> Ms. Hunt, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of people have, because I live over there, they know me, they call, text, or, or I see them and they mention those, especially like uh, Miss Omni, she mentioned that, and, and I pass all of that along to the city manager and, and he does his best to get them resolved. But it, yeah, there's a lot of issues. I, I would totally agree, but uh, that's uh, uh, not just myself, but, but all of us up here. I think if there's an issue, you know, pass it along to one of us and we'll, we'll make sure to, to pass it along. And because and, we don't know everything that goes on, but some of those, like you say, yes, I, I drive by and I see some of that or people tell me, so. Hi, my name is Sandra Oliver. I live at 409 Moore Street. I am in charge of keeping Grady Hensley's property clean and mowed and shrubberies done up. And I also do the lady across the street that lives in Kentucky on the corner of Quarry and Moore. 
I personally cut the grass, put it in a pile. It sat there for three weeks. I called the city and asked them when they would come and pick it up. The little lady that answered the phone, if I could have got to her, I would probably be incarcerated. She was rude, she was hateful, and I asked to even speak to her supervisor. A gentleman did call me back, and he said that he would be there within minutes to pick it up, and he did come and get it. But if they don't want to deal with the public, they don't need to be answering the phone. All right, thank you. I like, I like our street to be clean, just like Euclid. So I get out there and I do it. All right, so it sounds to me like we've got uh, some work to do for the Public Works Department, right? Council, I'm gonna, uh, be, I'm gonna be at collections first thing in the morning. Yeah, so it sounds like we've got the manager and y'all need to start driving around and see what's going on. This problem needs to be we're, fixed. We're gonna resolve this right. problem tomorrow. So uh, it takes- The little drives the Jeep light thing. It's got flashing lights on the back of it. I don't know his name right off. Uh, he had a vehicle in it. I thought it was a police car at first when he came up there. And it's got flashing lights and he wears a badge on his side. When he came, he said, I promise you, Miss Oliver, it will be picked up today. I said, well, I'm going to tell you what. I had scooted it from the middle of Quarry Street to the corner so that they would get it. They didn't come get it until he called and told them to get over and get it right then. And then right here in the Hans Alley, I had done the shrubbery on the backside and I put it in a neat pile. Well, the gentleman that come and got it with the uh, claw truck, he told me, he said, you're gonna have to either take it down to the street or put it in the middle of the alley. Well, if I put it in the middle of the alley, there's no way that they can come up and down that alley. Okay, it's right here with this alley right here. But I mean, I done all the shrubbery on that side and there was, a, there was a huge pile, I'm not gonna lie. And I, he said, they don't pick up tires, so we took the tires out of it. But the gentleman that come and picked it up, he told me from now on, we would either have to put it on the street or in the middle of the alley. Well, when I put it in the middle of the alley, that's gonna block the alleyway. Yeah, you can't yeah. do that. All right, so we got some issues to fix, it sounds like. So, Mr. McCullough, Mr. McCullough, city manager, is gonna drive around and fix them, right? So we're not gonna... Keep well, hearing these trash issues every every uh, council meeting that we get I in here. Right? You know, I, I do my best when I drive around and see things sitting along for a long period of time. I will alert uh, staff that that has been sitting there for a while. Um, I think collections they get there at seven in the morning. Is that correct? I'll be there to meet them, and we're going to resolve some of these issues real quick tomorrow. Okay. All right. Um, go ahead. I was going to ask a question about um, the number. When you were speaking about the number of trucks we have and some of the age and condition of some of the trucks that we currently have, I know we've it's been a little while since we've talked about putting together our capital plan. And I remember, you know, specifically we spoke about police cars and fire trucks. Um, is is that something that's already on the list? Some of our collections. I don't have that, that list in front of me, so I'd be afraid to say that they're within the capital plan for the next two years. Uh, uh, it's it's a separate fund. It's under the solid waste fund, so I'd, ha I'd okay. have to go look. But I I can get that information for you. Since the scheduling comes up quite a bit, it was brought up again tonight. Why why can't the ordinance have an appendix that shows a table that shows what all the schedules are when we're going to pick up on certain days, depending on this section of, of city we're talking about? I think we can do that. I don't have a problem doing that. What I would like to do, we'll have new software uh, sometime right here after the first of July that will allow us to see if our routes are the way routed the way they need to be. And once we do that, I mean, the routes may need to change. And if that's the case, I'd rather just change it at that time instead of putting it in and then having to repeal it. And okay, well, if you did that and you studied it and you had a grid and you knew which day to pick up, then you could have an appendix in here and then you could have, have them laying back there so everybody could pick one up. So the word would get out pretty quick right. what days and yeah. nobody would be confused because everybody gets confused on trash versus grass and you know so that would help a lot I think. All right any other discussion? All right what's the pleasure council? All right so <clears throat> I'll make a motion but do I have to list all of these changes we discussed or how, how does? Yeah you said they weren't substantial so I'm saying. <laughs> well, I'll list them. List I, I think I wrote them all down. But well, <laughs> If you wrote them all down then it might make the mayor happy. Go ahead and okay. list them. And we'll... 
All right, I'll make a motion that um, we have the first reading of, uh, hold on, let me think, that we have the first reading of this ordinance by caption only and with the following changes to the ordinance that in um, section 70.7 that we remove uh, item E out of 77 in 7021 that we add uh, language uh, that the uh, there will be no fee for a second can purchased before July 21st or July 1st 2019 uh, and uh, that residents may uh, receive a, a temporary can uh, one per year or whatever that is I think it's one per year um, in 7022 that we remove section E in 7024 that we uh, change uh, the last sentence to say uh, that the uh, person is qualified for uh, relief uh, and that the amount of the relief shall be 33% uh, of their current rate. Uh, in section 7028 that we remove section B and under item C, we add that, uh, that this um, bulk waste being demolished, that this is conducted by licensed contractors, that the work being done is by licensed contractor and subject to a class one misdemeanor. In section 7058, that we um, add language uh, that uh, there about the street that says, or any other street or alleyway, uh, as we discussed. As designated for vehicle traffic. As designated for vehicle traffic. And in item number C that we add, uh, the words bulk waste is considered in, in the definition. And I believe that was everything. But I will second notes. that and I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I was checking them off, so I wrote them that he got them on. So. All right. So we got a second, Mr. Wingard. Motion, Mr. Hartley. Any discussion? All right. Please call the roll. Farnham. Yes. Hartley. Yes. Osborne. Yes. Wingard. Yes. Mumpower. Yes. All right. Reading the ordinance caption only. Uh, council, this ordinance would read. Uh, um, to amend chapter 70 of the city code of ordinances solid waste you would have article one in general article two residential waste collection article three non-residential high or slash multifamily waste collection article four organic yard waste and bulk waste collection article five disposal practices all right all right item four consider a resolution regarding the issuance and sale of general obligation refunding bonds Staff report. Mayor, members of council. This agenda item is to consider a resolution regarding the issuance and refunding of general obligation refunding bonds. The item background an RFP was issued on May 23rd of this year for proposals to refinance the series 2006B and 2007B general obligation bond debt. This debt is 100% general fund debt that pays off in fiscal year 2027. The principal amount of the debt at June 30th is $3,090,000. The bonds will be issued for $3,210,000. The refinance does not extend the payoff date of this debt. David Rose with Davenport & Company, financial advisors to the city, is here to present the proposals. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of council, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, if you go just to turn to page one, I think someone's got that clicker. Where is it? Where is it? Oh. It's all right. Where do I, where do I aim it? Is it on? Is it on the side? All right. Um, again, members of council, Mr. Mayor, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I will be uh, fairly brief. Uh, just a few critical points that uh, 
uh, the chief financial officer just mentioned, uh, and that is that you have charged us with regularly monitoring the interest rates of existing debt outstanding. And as a result of what has happened over the last several months um, in talking with your staff, uh, an opportunity appears to have arisen. And so back on May 23rd, uh, earlier, we issued a request for proposal and sent it out to all banks within the region, locally, and even nationally. A couple of critical points here. Uh, just earlier this month, on June 11th, uh, we received five different banking responses, all of which uh, provided interest rate savings. I think it's important to point out that just a couple of years ago, when we did something similar to this, uh, we struggled to have even one banking institution to provide uh, information to us. Here we are today, thanks to what you all have done in terms of the finances of the city. And as a result of that, we received five distinct proposals, as I mentioned, including one from Chase Bank, which is arguably the largest bank in the United States. And so again, a very favorable response, and you can see there on the bottom. With that being said, on here on the second page, um, not only did we receive a response from Chase Bank, but also is the most cost effective, meaning the largest savings. Some of you may recall that when uh, the staff initially talked about a refunding opportunity, we have certain industry practices. One of those is to say that if the all-in cost of savings can be 3% present value or higher, it's considered worthy of a potential savings. Pleased to report that right now, based upon interest rates, we are looking at potential savings that is threefold larger than that. We're talking about savings in excess of 9%. So put it that in plain English, we were looking at something that was slightly over net of about $140,000, $150,000 of savings. Today, we're looking at something north of $300,000 of savings. What will be known specifically will be once the bond council makes a determination of exactly how the bonds are viewed, we can then lock in the savings. So right now, if I were sitting where you are looking at this resolution, I would say we're looking at something around $300,000 of net savings, which again is a solid twice the level of what we had talked about just a few months ago. That said, um, there's a few important points with this refinancing. It is fixed to the entire final maturity, which is roughly seven years. So as Mr. Spradlin said, we're not extending the maturity. We are just ex simply exchanging current interest rates, which are about 4.2% for an interest rate that's a little bit over 2%. So again, the math works in such a way that, again, the principle doesn't change, but the interest tied to it goes down considerably, and that's the 300,000 or so savings. So with that said, um, we are recommending that this council approve the resolution that's there for you, and at the same time recognize that once bond council gives all of us a definitive answer as to what we call the tax treatment, we will then know for certain what that savings will be. We do not expect that savings to differ much from around $300,000. Right now, it could be slightly below at 295, it could be slightly above at 320,000. That's roughly the range that we're looking at. And again, we're hoping that they will come to determination in the next few days so we can then sign off which be done by your staff, and that would lock us in until closing. And that closing here on the last page on the schedule is basically 
July 29th. And the reason for that is here we are on June 25th. We would basically pull all of the various documents together. We would then set up what we call an escrow as part of the requirements. And then we would send out a, a notice to all bondholders officially the next day that we will, in effect, call the bonds in, the interest rates that are 4.2 or so percent, and then provide those folks with the payoff and then have the remaining seven years at roughly 2.1 or 2.2 percent. So again, there's a lot of math involved, but it's a good thing, one that we'd like to be here on a regular basis. And you've asked us over time to say to you, are there opportunities? And the staff has made sure that we stay on top of this. So this really started uh, in the early part of the calendar year. And by the time it's over, we'll take about six or seven months to, to effect, and that's where we are. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, okay. Any questions from council? Hardly anything. Yeah. Uh, do you have any input on when the um, this is the sidebar conversation or when the rating agencies would get back to look at the city's uh, financial rating? It's a very good question, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have talked with staff about getting through to the rating agencies they on a regular basis contact us as they call it surveillance which they do for all local governments um, but i think we're thinking about of course we're going to notify them about this which will be positive but we'll also look forward to once the fiscal year ends which is just a few days and once we have some indications which we expect i think it would say probably middle of August to late August. And we actually um, just heard from them recently and we're scheduled to speak with them the 1st of July. I think July the 3rd, we're still I've coordinating that, that exactly. with your office. Basically pretty much the morning of July 3rd, which is they've sent us some questions. And so we'll talk to, that's Moody's. And then we're gonna talk as well um, to the other rating agency, Standard & Poor's, um, probably again, a little bit later once the fiscal year ends. So this is part of their surveillance. Uh, we've been in contact with your staff, um, and we expect some good results from those uh, those rating discussions we do. So have you kept up with the, the recent um, financial position, the cash that we've uh, put aside and all Very that? So, so do you see anything in our portfolio of financial numbers that would indicate anything other than a positive uh, outlook from the rating agencies? Not unless something happened in the last uh, two or three days, no, sir. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your work. Thank you. All right. Any um, discussion at all from council? Questions at all? Okay. All right. Let's see. Public comment. This is item four. No one signed up for this item. Okay. Reading of the resolution. Resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of general obligation refunding bonds of the City of Bristol, Virginia, and providing for the form, details, and payment thereof. Okay, what's the uh, pleasure, Council? I move to uh, adopt the resolution. Hold, hold on just two seconds. Let's do that by no. caption only. I don't think that was said. I was going to, uh, well, I was going to say that next. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, what's pleasure, Council? We will do this motion by caption only. So by caption only, I move to adopt the resolution regarding the issuance and sale of general obligation refunding bonds. All right, any discussion? Uh, I'll second that. Uh, okay, I guess second then, Mr. Hartley, yeah. but Mr. Osborne has got the motion. Uh, caption only. Any discussion? i just add a comment. It's really great to, to be able to do this. I mean, not to save money and not extend the life of the bonds, too. That That's very positive and... Uh, as Mr. Rose said, it's good to see the the response. Is, it, and I remember what he's talking about before the, with the previous response. So that's uh, a good sign that we're moving in the right direction. You know, I, I would echo your comments. I mean, this is one of those things that, that's completely a no-brainer, and it's it's one of those you know just generally good news things that we're able to we're in a position to be able to do this and just save some money. You know, we're we're going to be we're not extending the life of the debt. We're still able to pay it off in FY 2027. We're just able to save some money with a little bit of a better, better interest rate. So 
So I appreciate the work you all have done and the city manager's office has done on it. And I'm glad this is, a, this is an option for us. All right, anything else? All right, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. All right, item five, consider approval of personnel policies. Staff report. Uh, council, as over the past month or so, we have uh, discussed personnel policies, mainly annual leave policy, sick leave, and compensatory time leave. Those sections were enumerated in our uh, city code. Uh, we have repealed those uh, sections from our code of ordinances, and tonight uh, is an opportunity for you all to approve these policies that will be part of our employee policy handbook. And uh, Mr. Christian, I, I'd sent you an email previously on uh, the other, well, I didn't send that one to you, I don't think. Let me send you another one here in just a second. Um, but what this amounts to is the annual leave for employees will be changed uh, between a 40-hour employee and a, and a fire department employee. A zero to two years of service, a 40-hour employee will earn eight hours of paid time off per month. A fire department employee will earn 12 hours of paid time off per month with a max accrued leave of 192 hours. A three to five year employee will have um, 10 hours of paid time off per month. A fire department employee will be 14 hours of paid time off per month, 192 hours maximum. Six to 10 year employee will earn 12 hours per month. Fire department will earn 16 hours per month for a maximum of 240 hours. A 11 to 15 year employee will earn 14 hours of paid time off per month. Um, we currently have it listed as 19 hours uh, for the fire department employees. However, a couple of council members have suggested maybe rounding that up to 20 hours per month for a max of 288 hours. 16 to 20 year employee would earn 16 hours of paid time off per month. A fire department employee would earn 22 hours per month and a 21 uh, year plus employee would earn 18 hours per month and a fire department employee would earn 24 hours per month. So that's the main issues uh, in regards to the annual leave policy, which is a, uh, a difference compared to what we currently do. Now we have years of service bans from zero to five, six to 10 and 11 plus. So this uh, extends those service bans. It allows employees to earn more paid time off uh, sooner and it, it rewards employees who have been, who stay longer or rewards them for a longer period of time. So the compensatory time, this puts a cap on compensatory time for uh, all employees to be maxed at 80 hours. If it's a non-exempt employee and they have compensatory time that exceeds 80 hours, they would be paid overtime at the overtime rate of one and a half times of their regular pay and the compensatory time for non-exempt employees shall be taken by June the 15th of every year and it would be paid on June the 30th or shortly thereafter if they are over that limit. Uh, law enforcement employees and fire protection employees are defined under 9.1700 of the Virginia Code and all overtime compensation is subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act. Exempt employees may be granted hour for hour comp time for the hours worked over a 40 hour work week up to 80 hours within a physical fiscal year and shall be taken before June 30th of each year. And then finally, the sick leave policy has not changed as it was in the ordinance. It stays the same. Um, and a lot of that is governed based on your hire date, uh, whether you're considered a um, plan one, plan two, or a hybrid employee based on uh, for your sick leave. It, well, it did change for uh, fire department employees in regards to the 24 hours they work and how much time they leave to earn as well as sick time. So any questions that I can answer in regards to those policies? Okay, no one signed up for public comment. So what's the pleasure council on this item? <clears throat> Move to approve uh, the new personnel policies. I guess uh, would that include changing the for a fire department employee? Would that include rounding that up to 20 hours? Uh, it listed as 19 hours per month right now. Uh, I know a couple of council members had mentioned uh, we're just rounding that up to 20 to make it a round number. 
<clears throat> is that fair across the board with the rest of the city employees? That yep. has been my biggest concern with this whole thing here. What that does, um, you can see the multiplier. The multiplier for the fire department's 1.33. And um, to make it fair and basically for accounting purposes, there are certain bands where they may get a little bit more than 1.33. Uh, and this, but for the most part, this is fair across the board. It's as, it's as fair as it can get unless you go to a very 10.64 hours or 13.33 hours. Uh, this is fair. It rounds up the fire department just by usually a half hour or an hour, depending on where it lands. Okay, because that is a change there that I did not see. <clears throat> as long as as long as it is fair and consistent throughout the whole entire department of this entire city, right. I, I'm okay with that. Well, and what it does, it makes it consistent on those years of service bands. It goes from 12, 14, 16, then it would jump to 20, 22, and 24, uh, because once you multiply 14 hours for a regular employee times 1.33, that jumps to 18.62 hours on that on that multiplier. So I rounded it to 19, um, but by rounding it to 20, it keeps it even numbers and it does make it consistent. It's still it's still within a range of consistency. That's not, um, in my mind, it's it's not terrible. Not terrible. <laughs> it's not terrible. So so it could be better. It could be. I mean. To make it perfect, you would put it at 18.62. Well, I think that's asking a little much. So uh, I'm okay with the 19. I move that we approve. 19, 19 or 20. Because as the current policy is, it's 19. Oh, I, I'm going to make the motion that it's at 20. Okay. I mean, at 19. I'm sorry. Okay, at, at 19. Okay. Because when you start making that other uh, move to 20, it opens up the window for there not to be consistency throughout the whole entire departments in this city. Okay. So, and consistency is what we need. Everybody is just as valuable and just as important. So we need consistency. So I make the motion at 19 that was presented in our packets. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we had a motion of Mr. Wingard. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second, Mr. Osborne. All right, council discussion. I <clears throat> You know, I understand the consistency, but that, to me, that's not too far off rounding. And, and that's a band, if you look at it, that 10 to 15, where I think it's real, you know, it's, it's a wide band. It's wider than the bands below it. Plus, uh, it, it's an area where I think it'd be real important to try to keep people here, and that may be an incentive uh, to keep people. But just from an accounting thing, it's, it makes all the numbers even. I don't know how you use 19 hours. I mean, you know, 20 is, is, would be, it's more an even number. You're going to use those in even numbers anyway. It, I understand. And, and that's the thought. And I, and I understand what you're saying. It, it's not too far afield. It, a little bit, but it's more of a rounding thing. I understand that, but there's no perfect policy and plan that can be implemented. Yeah. That it's not going to have some well, kind of flaw it, or some yeah. kind of downside to it. But what we need to shoot for and strive for more than anything is consistency throughout every department in the city because everybody is as valuable as the next. I'm not, it, and it catches back up once you get yeah, to the it'll next band. Yeah. I mean, so that, that was the only thought there is just, I think from a, an accounting point, it would be easier to deal with round numbers. But. So I had a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> so regular department employees, so 52 weeks a year, 40 hours a week, right? 20,000, 2,080 hours, right? right? So what's the what's the same 52 week uh, work hours for the police department? 2,080. Okay. And what's the same for the fire department over 52 weeks? 2,756. Okay, 2,756. So the required work schedules, right, that 
these employees are required to work is 2756 for fire department 2080 for everybody else so so that's uh, quite a few more work hours right that everybody understands understands that now I looked at this and I thought about it a number of ways and this one is a lot more complicated than any system I'd seen ever in the past, including the military. And so this seemed to be quite open for unfairness to me uh, because of the discrepancy in work hours, because of the discrepancy in a lot of things. So typically, you know, you're going to pay folks their salary based on their skill set and job titles. So the, the fire, the police, and the departments get paid a salary for their work. And then you earn a benefit called paid time off of some amount, right? And normally that's pretty equal across the board no matter what your job title is and where you know where you are now private industry makes a little bit different segregation based on the number of years of service sometimes you'll see zero to two will get you know two weeks 80 hours you get five years you'll get another week you'll get you know 120 hours then you'll get up to 15 years you'll get another week right now the military is 30 days doesn't matter if you're an e1 or an o10 Right? You get 30 days paid vacation every year, no matter what. No matter your job title, no matter anything, it's 30 days. That's very simple. So it's fair across the board. So it doesn't matter what rank you are or where you're at. So this one having different hours, so when you kind of multiply those numbers on numbers that table you had, there's, di there's different hours there. So I think, just looking at it, it's, it's open for unfairness. And so I don't think it's prudent to put it out there until we've thought about this and studied this from a couple different angles because you're talking about a pretty major personnel benefit here um, change right by doing this so so I've got a problem with it you know as it stands it would be it's way more complicated than I would ever do I would I would probably flatline it I'd make it really simple and uh, I, I would justify it based on maybe the, the work hours a little bit but Maybe not, because they're paid for their work hours and then their time off, their time off. So I'd have to think about that a little bit to see how I would reconcile what would be fair or not. But I don't think it's fair to have one group and, and another group having completely different uh, benefit roll-ups um, because it's paid time off, it's vacation time, it's not time at work, it's not your work, you know, you're paid on, you know, you're paid on your work time differently than you're paid on your benefits. So that's just that's just the way I'm looking at it. Well, I understand that, but we've got two departments. One works a 24-hour shift, and the other one works 12. <clears throat> right, so is the military. They make no distinction. I understand that, but the vast majority of all city employees work an eight-hour day. Got that. I understand so that. So you need to have, <clears throat> you know, your uh, your number that equalizes the time off per shift. And it's 1.33 seems to be the magic number for the fireman. It was 1.04 or 1.05 for a police officer, which was marginal. So the wide gap was with the police department with the 24 hour shifts. So the 1.33 seemed to be the closest that we're going to get to that, to where at the end of the day, when it's all totaled up, it's more fair across the board with everybody, from the people picking up our trash to the city manager. So this seems to be the right thing to do. I mean, is it perfect? I don't know. I doubt it, but it well, seems to be the right thing to do. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, we repealed the ordinance, so we, we have to have a policy in place <laughs> by July 1. I mean, because we've already repealed the ordinance uh, to take effect. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's one of those we may, you know, and now that it's a policy, it's a lot easier to tweak. Uh, if, you, if you see something uh, out of place, we could go back. But I think the bigger theory here is, is one to make it as is, is, uh, vice mayor said to make it fair I, I agree with that uh, but and, and it should be uh, but it also adds the band one thing it adds bands which uh, gives people you know for the years of service more 
uh, incentive to stay with the city. But the biggest thing in repealing the ordinance is it changes from days to hours. And I think that kind of equalizes things too for people that work a 24 hour shift. You don't take a day off, you take 24 hours off. So you have to accumulate that much. So it, it does kind of, I think will equalize out a little better. Um, you know, it's not exactly perfect. There's still a little bit of rounding there, uh, but it's, it's pretty close. I, th I think it makes it more equitable, I think is, is what we're going for. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's on the, on the bands of service. There, there have only been three bands of service. Is that That's correct. It was zero to five, five to 10 and 10 plus. And so this, this especially this, this on the back end rewards people who've stayed with the city for 20 years, you know, it, it, it um, makes it more fair for them. So right. if someone's been here for 10 years in one day and someone's been here for 30 years, they're not necessarily on the same playing field at, right. at this point or with it, with this new policy, which I think is good. But I do think that the fire department's a special exception because they do work three times as much in a work day as a normal person works in a work day. So I, I think they're a special exception here. And I, I do want to add that we did do locality comparison studies in regards to this and localities that have a paid fire department, they have a different time off than a regular, their time off is similar to what I'm proposing. Uh, your normal employee, your 2,080 hour employees have a certain amount of time off and your uh, fire department employees are usually based on a multiplier. Uh, the numbers that have been presented to you all in regards to fire department are within uh, very close range of what other localities do. Localities we looked at were Martinsville, Radford, Waynesboro, Stanton, City of Bristol, Tennessee, City of Roanoke, Salem, Town of Withful, and the City of Charlottesville. So um, most of these localities have two different, two different leave systems for fire department employees as compared to regular employees. Okay, no discussion? Uh, I just, uh, I was going to say, you know, we're making a lot of changes and, and we're using that term a lot, changes, um, and I, I'd almost, I'd rather use the term, you know, help versus hurt. Is this something that helps every employee or does it hurt every employee? Does it help some employees but hurt other employees? So I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, take a little more time to look at it before I would be ready to vote yes on it. Okay, anything else? All right, so we do have a motion by Mr. Wingard, right? You made the motion? I made the motion. Second, Mr. Osborne. All right, please call the roll. Fardo? No. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? No. All right, item six, discussion of funding for school building needs. <coughs> uh, council, this is a continuation of the discussion that we've had in the past in regards to um, our follow-up meeting with the school board, which is scheduled for July 1st at 6 p.m. We are um, coming down to the wire to determine, or maybe not, it's uh, up to you all, but we do have a meeting with them on July 1st, and I think they're looking uh, for a certain amount of money that we can or cannot uh, increase their budget as to how we want to fund potential uh, rehabilitation of their current schools or the building of a potential new school or rehabbing some schools and building a new school as well. So I'll just leave it open for council to start that discussion. Okay. Before we do that, do we have any updates on the, from the CFO on the funds we're looking at it by year end? We just got May closed today. Um, so we're, we're not um, near closing June. We do think that um, fiscal year 20 was a favorable year for the city. Keep in mind, we have already benchmarked or committed um, $1 million of 18-19 funds. We do expect that um, we will have additional monies that are identifiable. I don't have a number yet. I, I will tell you that um, I I'm, I'm not going to give an estimate until I've got June closed, but um, I, I think fiscal year 20 does not look like fiscal year 19. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong budget year. Fiscal year 19 was a good year for the city, not um, as cash flow positive as fiscal year 18, but um, 
So I'm, I'm not ready to give a number yet. So you got a yet. feel though, it's, it's, it's $50,000 or is it more like 500,000 or more? I mean, you gotta have a feel for the number. I do have a feel for the number, but we still have five days left I'm in the fiscal year. I'm not gonna hold you to it, what's your, what's your it's sense? It's on video. What's your sense? <laughs> um, I, I believe that we will have, if you keep, keep in mind, the $1 million that we've already committed of this year's funds, I think there will be an estimate of um, a million to $2 million. Okay. And that doesn't include the 320 that would come back for the refinancing, right? I'm sorry? That wouldn't include the 320 or 300,000 that uh, Davenport reported. No, on the that won't take effect until the financing is closed. Right. That is not 300,000 in one year. It's $40,000. Forty, about forty thousand yeah. dollars over the, over the life of the refinance. Okay. Once again, that was an unaudited estimate I gave you as of June twenty fifth. Okay, so we'll open open up for discussion. We're going to have some extra monies. It sounds like to uh, have to talk about. At least don't know what the exact number is. Don't everybody talk at once. Well, I just, if we're trying to figure out what we can afford the schools, I think I've told different people this. So I'm going to say, you know, as far as one time, you're looking at one time money and recurring money. We don't know what the amount of one time money is, and uh, we still need to build up the debt reserve, uh, look at potentially maybe, I think, when we set money aside into the emergency rainy day fund whatever we called it um uh, we still probably i think we felt that wasn't quite adequate that it might need some more but uh if we have an amount some near what the cfo had we could set some of that aside i think uh for the schools we've already identified some money for them um you know on an ongoing basis going forward you know uh, my feeling is that you're probably looking in the range of uh, I'd say two to three hundred thousand I, I would feel in, in a year or two you could get to that looking beyond that there's a lot of question marks I, I wouldn't feel comfortable going much above that it's possible but um, you know I think part of this is what what would you you know they they need to know a number and whether it's just one-time money or ongoing money uh, to figure out what's best with that. Um, so that's, you know, as far as funding kind of where I think we land. I mean, um, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it, use that to start. Okay, I'm gonna come in on behind that and uh, <clears throat> I mean, for this physical year here, uh, throughout the summer, they're getting roughly somewhere around two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars for the vestibules and and to fix some ADA compliance issues with restrooms. Okay, <clears throat> the uh, budget has already been passed. The money's already been allocated, pretty much, you know, sp spent according to the way this council saw fit to s spend it at that time. <clears throat> I would like to take a, a conservative approach to the schools. We know that they have problems, they have issues, but I would not be comfortable making commitments of another two or $300,000 at this time. I think the council and the school board needs to get together again in a short timeline we need to keep this conversation going about fixing up and modernizing our current buildings. We need to see a list that is reasonable from the school system of stuff that can be done, not a bunch of wants, but what is true necessities and get our head wrapped around what has to be done. <clears throat> um, is there money that we can pull out of this budget, this new budget? I'm sure there is. I mean, but we don't need to overreact. 
This is a decades long problem that our school system has failed to maintain these buildings and then want to lay it on our lap in one year because they didn't get a new school last year. We need to get our heads fully wrapped around this and not shoot from the hip and make a bunch of promises that we cannot fulfill. So the 285 this year is going to give them vestibules, it's going to give them some ADA bathrooms, it's going to give them a uh, elevator at one of the schools. That's a big summer project, but it cannot stop there. We have to budget to keep them up. That's my comments on that right now. Well, I think that, you know, as opposed to saying uh, fiscally conservative, I think we need a fiscally responsible way to move forward with this. Uh, I do think if we're, you know, we're fully aware of the problems at the schools, not only at the elementary schools at this point, but at the middle school and at the high school. So I, I think we have to have a plan in place. And I, I do think that's going to be a recurring additional allocation every year, you know, whether it, whether it be for building, building a school, fixing a school, fixing all the schools, fixing a couple, building one, I, you know, whatever the, the plan is, we're going to need an additional recurring appropriation to be able to meet that. Because uh, at this point, we know all the problems, you know, and, and if we want to be fiscally responsible, if we just want to be responsible stewards of our city buildings, you know, it, it's malpractice at this point not to do something. So, I mean, we have to have some additional recurring allocation going into this. <clears throat> and I mean, if, you know, like Mr. Hartley said, if it's two or $300,000 a year, we could find it somewhere, you know, that would be, that would be good. I'd be in favor of more if we had it, but you know, we run the budget tight and it's, it's hard to find more than that. You know, it's hard to find 200,000 as it is, but, but I mean, I, I would be of the opinion we have to have a, an additional recurring allocation if we're going to build or fix or any combination of, of the two. So, uh, CFO, the number you threw out there, whether it's a million, million, two million, five, two million, whatever, so that is above and beyond the million, million, four we already set aside for the debt service and the uh, emergency fund? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'll say it again. I think uh, I can firmly say we put too much in the emergency fund. 1.4 is not needed for an emergency in this city, but we should set aside two accounts, new construction fund and a current building fund for the school system. And whatever money's, you know, come from that, you know, extra, once we close the books, should be somehow a majority of that set aside um, for the school system. And um, I'm, I'm, I said a million dollars last time, and I think it could be probably more than that. And I'm gonna stick to my million, because I, I still feel like it could be a million. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's over commitment us. I think it's putting money where it belongs. I think we've sat here too long, not done anything, and it sends the message that we're serious about new construction and we're serious about fixing what we've got. And you don't, you don't put $30,000 in there and serious about it, you put substantial money in there. And if we've got it, we need to put it in there. Um, and so that's where I'm at. And so I would support that. And I did reach out to Mr. Alvis and um, we committed to figure out a plan to work, to figure out this whole ma maintenance, you know, who's gonna do what to make sure we maintain the buildings. He's gonna send me um, what they've already put together, which is a very detailed list of um, what their plan already is to take care of each building. So we'll look at that and see if we need to tweak it and where we can apply city resources to help them um, do that so we can maintain our buildings. That's what we committed to. We'll, we'll figure that out and get that wrapped up. So um, I'll say it again. I think we need to be serious. We're, we're, we've got to be serious, serious, serious about what we're going to do about the school system. And um, it, it starts with us setting up accounts and start putting money aside, just like you would set any savings account up for your personal account to put money aside to have to build a home or buy a new car or whatever you're going to do, right? you got to start somewhere. So that's what we need to do. And so every good city does that. So let's start and show that we're a good city and let's start putting money aside for those uh, endeavors. And, um, and then as they see the need for a project, we can all come together and we know some money's there. We can talk about the responsible way of applying money to those projects out of those funds. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a lot going on here because we're talking about, well, on the city side, everyone knows in a few years the amount of, of money that we pay for our debt payments is going to go up. 
Uh, we also have other things going on like police cars, fire trucks, other buildings. Um, so we, we've been talking, you know, part of that has been about the school system too that we've been talking about. And, and I think you know, what we're talking about here, recurring additional funds every year would be recurring additional funds for the construction of a new school ultimately. We've been speaking specifically about the elementary schools and I think we had a good conversation with the school board, um, I guess it was earlier this month. It, it seemed like the discussion was, okay, what, what's the plan? Do we fix up our four current buildings? Do we have one location? Do we have other options? Two locations across the city, three locations across the city. So it, it sounded like a lot of folks, you know, and yeah, I may be wrong, but it sounded to me like a lot of folks talked about, well, maybe instead of four elementary schools, we have three elementary schools across the city. We build a, a new one. Now, ultimately, all the details of that plan will ultimately come down to the school board, um, and then the city council is just responsible for, for committing and, and funding it. So um, I, th I think the school system is, is definitely important in terms of not saying that the other things are not important, like police cars, fire trucks, other buildings we've got, but, but the school system is especially important because, one, you know, the kids that go through the school system here, you know, and, and buildings are one part of it, but also another part of it is uh, the, the teachers and the staff that, that they interact with every day. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, kids grow up here and go through the school system and then they end up going to college and then they come back to teach, to work in the same school system because they've had such a great experience. I mean, the school system is important that way, but it's also important for folks who end up um, moving here, relocating here to the city. We want to be able to show off our school system and show them uh, folks moving here with kids, what kind of benefits they'll have bringing their kids into the Bristol, Virginia public school system. So there's a, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of uh, details to still work out, but but I do think we, we need to make a priority to, to commit additional funds, recurring funds, to our school system. And if that's for the purpose of building a new school, definitely, yes. Uh, now, where will that be and how many and what's the exact plan? I, I'm looking forward to the discussion more on Monday with school board members to get their opinions, but we've got a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm happy that we're at least having the conversations and laying out these options and looking at them to, uh, to try to figure out what's the best going forward. I mean, so. I, I, I agree. I mean, we're having good conversations. We had a good conversation at the school board, and, and I think the thing I walked away was the question was, we need to talk amongst ourselves before we get back together on July 1st. And we said, we want options. And they're like, well, we need to have a range of, of funding to get, that's why I threw out an exact number. I mean, I, I think it needs to be recurring. Uh, again, depending on at the end of the year, once we get that number and it's solidified, uh, I'm not saying that the mayor is wrong. I think setting some money aside could be helpful either um, if you wanted to, to do some things to the existing buildings or, or I think, would if, especially if you went forward with uh, new construction, as we talked about at Van Pelt, there's probably cost, site work, other things that, that we could use to, to lower the cost of the overall uh, construction or things that might pop up that are outside the scope uh, like up there they were talking about the part of the turning lanes and the road and stuff so it, it would be helpful either way uh, to have that money to use again what are the options how would you use it I don't know but if you don't know what that amount is it's hard for the school board to get, come back and give us those options but uh, uh, you know I think uh, we'll see come July 1, I guess, uh, and we sit down, but, um, you know, I think having options is what, what we all want is, is uh, I think last time we were given one option, and, and I think everybody would like to see more options, uh, but they want to know kind of a range uh, so they can know what, what options to, would be feasible or work within that range. I think during all the discussions of new school construction, it's specifically been about a new school construction of an elementary school. And it seems like that's where the greatest need is to me. And then there's other issues that are going on at the middle school and the high school, but it seems like um, 
you know, what, what we're talking about now, it's important to take care of the elementary schools now so we don't kick the can down the road. Because there have been other issues we've talked about and we've sat up here and we've talked and said, wow, why didn't they think of that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago and start making a plan to prepare for something? So maybe in 10 or 20 years, we, I don't know what we're gonna have to do with the middle school, the high school, but it seems to me now, if we take care of the elementary school needs now, that'll be taken care of and then we can start planning on those future needs 10, 20 years from now for the middle school, the high school. Um, so it seems, I, I feel like we are going about it the right way, talking about the elementary school needs right now. Um, yeah, it absolutely, it, it yeah. needs to be a two-pronged thing because, you know, maybe we, maybe we fix the elementary school situation and we're, you know, think we're, you know, doing really great and then 10 or 15 years from now, the high school sneaks up on us mm -hmm. all of a sudden and that's not gonna be cheap at all. That's an mm -hmm. enormous, enormous building. And I think it'd be a two-pronged thing where we'd want, you know, like the mayor said, you know, partly, to, to start setting aside money for that. Yeah, I mean, we got to get back to a plan that most municipalities do, where you got to plan on a school every 10 to 20 years. You you're, you've got to deal with over the next 50 years, you got to deal with five schools, and one of those being high school. So that's got to be, you know, we can't just plan out for the next five years. We we need to see a comprehensive 50-year plan because. <clears throat> Once we get the 15 million for the first elementary school, we're going to quickly need the next 15 million for the next elementary school, and then 15 years later, you're going to have it for you know needing it for the high school. So we can't go from what was it 1974 when the Van Pelt was built till here we are today. We've went what 40 years, and we've not done anything to a single school. But before that, we were we were pretty regular at building a school about every. I guess 38 and in the 40s Stonewall was about every 10 to 15 years there was a school being being constructed and then we got away from it. So we just abandoned the methodical approach to taking care of your buildings long term and we got to get a plan that gets back to that, right? So we can see what to do. Well, the reason why the city got away from that is because we started declining as a city. Up until 1974, we was continuously growing. And then, and then we started declining, okay? And we are still declining today. And everybody has got to keep it forefront in the center that we have got to grow this city. We have got to turn the tide and grow this city. And in doing that, then a lot of our problems, the vast majority of our problems go away. It is easy to plan for growth when you're growing. There's money coming in. Unfortunately, we don't have that situation. We have to keep this city going under its current finances and the surroundings and the environment that we have found ourselves in. We've had a gentleman today come to us and tell us that when he calls the city about why his garbage is not picked up, one of the three answers is the truck is down. Now, if we go committing all of our money, yeah, these new companies coming in here, if we can get them on the hook and reel them in here, the new schools is a selling point. But let me tell you what is not a selling point is for our garbage not to be picked up on the street because we can't afford to keep our trucks up and running. And we look like a trashy little city. There, Every department in this city has needs that it is up to us to make sure that they are funded to continue to operate this city. And if we overextend because it sounds good to help the schools, it's all for the kids and other departments suffer, then we have failed to do our job for this whole entire city. And we need to be mindful of that. So we need to proceed with caution. We need to keep the dialogue open with the school board and find out exactly what the needs are. They are our buildings and they have been mismanaged. That has got to stop. And we will figure out how to do that. <clears throat> and in light of some new information, 
You know, we had the school board meeting, and I asked them if, if had they went through the budget, line item by line item, is there any money that they can set aside and give up for some remodeling on the schools? I was told no. They had been through the line item budget, li the budget line item by line item. There was no extra money. And then I hear right at the last minute before their season, their books close out this year, the teachers got a 200 and, was it 18? $213,000 bonus to be split up among all the teachers and staff. That $200,000 could have went a long ways. So we need to dig into this to find out exactly what happened here. And we need to make sure that we're all playing together under the same rules. So I'm gonna say let's keep the dialogue going but not overextend ourselves because these other departments and this city has needs, not just the school board and the schools. I have two comments, one about what you said and one about what you said about, um, well, specifically the high school. Um, wouldn't that be great if, right, going back to that long-term plan, if, okay, we take care of the elementary schools now. And, and I'll just throw this out there. We'll talk about this more with the school board, but you know, we've thrown out, okay, let's say there's an elementary school at Van Pelt and we're doing some work to that. There's an elementary school at Stonewall Jackson that's fixed up and remodeled. And correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Perigen, those are the two schools with the highest number of students, uh, Stonewall Jackson and Van Pelt. So the, the two smaller schools, Highland View, Washington Lee, if there's a, if we do take on a project and build a new school, if it's if for that part in the middle of the city and the two smaller schools become one there, and, and we have three nice elementary schools, um, you know, wouldn't it be great then to start shifting our focus onto the, the long term, like the high school, if in say 20 or 30 years, we say we need to build a new high school. And wouldn't it be great to say, we've been planning on that. We've been saving money for 20 years, and we're ready for that. Um, so it, it's exciting to, to be at this point, to take these steps, to try to figure it out. And, and what you were saying, Mr. Wingard, uh, you know, I, I do think as we go through this process, it's, you know, we've started having dialogue with the school board. And it, I just think one thing we need to do is, you know, the council and city management commit to just being open and transparent about everything with the school board and the school board be open and transparent about everything with us and we work together ultimately to try to put it all together and figure it out. I, I would agree with you and um, kind of a couple things to follow up. I'll, we have a lot of pressing issues in the city. We, we got the landfill, we got the trash pickup, we've got the debt sitting out there, we got the school system sitting out there, but I mean, and they're all pressing and I wouldn't want to prioritize one over the other, but I mean, just as a as a quick you know, math thing, the newest school was built in 1974. I would venture a guess that we have bought a trash truck since 1974. I, I would say we have one that's less than 45 years old. So I mean, they're all pressing, but this is, this is pressing because it's, it's a much larger problem and it'll snowball and get a lot worse. So I mean, we have to do something. We, we've got to do something. And I think that's gonna require additional funding and as with the um, $213,000 uh, bonus, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this. So the way that the, the way the school system's funding works, we, you, we, send, we send you money from the locality here, you get money from the state. And certain state monies have to be returned at the end of the fiscal year if they're not used, or, or how does, can, can we let him talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can come, there. come on down. <laughs> You're close. So enlighten me. We state money is where the bulk of our money comes from. Obviously, city money is the next, and then federal money. Um, our city money we have more flexibility with. Our state money, most of that state money is earmarked, and so the bonuses, which was not a last-minute thing, that was something we've been talking about 
I mean, if you read the newspapers, our teachers were really fired up because I recommended no raise for teachers at the top of the scale and was going to give them a straight bonus. Anyway, we ended up changing that. Teachers at the top of the scale ended up getting a 2% raise and we adjusted the bonuses accordingly. So that was not a new thing. That's, we actually paid for a, a bulk of those bonuses through a fund called the at-risk add-on, which was an increase, that was a line item that was increased by the governor and the general assembly for the current year during the current year. Uh, we also received some additional other state monies and that's that's the monies that were used for bonuses. And those were not recurring funds. Those were all one-year funds that we could have carried over and state carry over, but you're still, they're still earmarked. You don't get to carry those state funds over and change the earmark. None of those could have been used for facilities. That, it was definitely not a last minute thing. We, I mean, read the Bristol paper, there was, I mean, multiple articles about it. Uh, come to our school board meetings, look at our agendas, there were multiple comments about it. But, the um, bottom line is you can, we have an agreement with the city that with city funds we can carry over up to $200,000 and place that in our capital account. Anything above that with local funds that are remaining, we either have to ask you to carry it forward or uh, we have to give it back. State funds, there's a code section that I shared with the uh, with city uh, <clears throat> management today. It's not a new code section. It's that's uh, a code section that's been around for a while, that if you do have additional state funds that are left over at the end of the year, you are able to carry those over, but you can't, can't change the reason for the funding form. So those wouldn't have qualified for any kind of, <clears throat> when, when we had asked about um, anything in your line items that you could have used, this wouldn't have qualified for that anyway, because this was state money that was earmarked for a certain Right, at-risk add-on has, no, you cannot use that for funding whatsoever. Our lottery account, you can, use some of that funding for some facility issues, but you not, I mean, it's, most of lottery is non-recurring. I mean, one thing, at some point we may want to look at that agreement, why they capped it at 200,000 to carry over to facilities. I think it, if that's the need and we're talking about that, I mean, if you can, if you have money left over, you know, I, I don't see why you wouldn't either spend it in that current year or at least roll it over for that particular purpose because clearly, I mean, looking at this for, well, you're always going to have a need for facilities, but it's a clear need right now. So it may be something at some point we want to consider looking at that. It may well, be another I, I, way to find funds to d do some of this work we've talked about. Since I, I'm, I'm going to say this from memory, but since I've been here, which is three, two and a half years to so three budget cycles, we've not been able to carry over the full two hundred thousand dollars, so I mean to increase that, it you know, it'd be great if we could, but we just we don't, you know, we don't have the the ability to do that. We do not anticipate meeting the full two hundred thousand this year. However, that fund has been a great arrangement for us because we have used that to take care of some <coughs> facility needs. Uh, for example, that's what we're using currently at Van Pelt uh, to make those renovations uh, at Van Pelt. So. Um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, we have buildings that are 100 years old, 80 years old, 70 years old, 60 years old. You'll be hard pressed to find another division who has maintained their buildings and kept them for that long. So to say that we've not maintained our buildings, I mean, we've got a lot of use, a lot of use out of those buildings. So I would say that we have, it just all buildings have an end of life. And unless you're at somewhere like Harvard, and those buildings are very old, but they're constantly building new buildings on those campuses. And we've not been we've not been doing it, but we have been maintaining our buildings. Would it make sense, or would it be possible, or I don't know if this is a good idea or not, to take the capital fund that you all have for capital needs and split it into two, and have your capital fund for for ongoing current needs day to day, but then have a the other part of it would be. Um, essentially like a fund for new school, the new school construction fund. So we actually do, part of our local appropriation goes towards the day-to-day -day needs. I mean, that's mm -hmm. you know how we take care of maintenance issues as they, as they come throughout the course of the year. I'll give you a prime example, and this is something that's not on the capital list, I think, that Mr. Alvis is gonna share with you because we didn't have the expertise to know that it needed to be, but we had a transformer at Virginia High. Thank goodness it was two days after graduation that it blew, it blew up. It was a, a large transformer in the new wing uh, at Virginia High, which was built in the 80s. So, you know, that was, you know, a third, 40 year, basically a 40 year old transformer and it blew. 
Well, you can't go to Lowe's and buy one of those. I mean, they're not there. And so we were out without power for a big part of our building at Virginia High School for about four days. Um, the initial estimates that we were looking at were thirty and forty thousand dollars to replace that one transformer. Um, thankfully, we were able to get it cheaper than that. But we were we would have had to close school had we still been in session for four days because we were completely out of power. Now that's brought up another interesting conversation. We still have 1950 era transformers in our basements, and you know they're not going to last forever either. And they're definitely more than the the thirty or forty thousand dollars to replace that's not currently part of our capital list simply because we didn't have the expertise to know that those transformers were you know approaching end of life and we're not talking about HVAC units or or anything like that we're talking about the transformers that, that feed the buildings and so you know we still we've got some work to do to go back and fix our capital list but it's not going to make it go down I mean those those costs are only going to go up so you've been up front of the state quite a bit on funding issues right through the last couple of years so has anything come up ever uh, as far as the state talking about school construction school issues because we're not the only absolute city in the state that's got school degradation issues so this past budget year uh, there was money for the first time since 2009 that was put back into the literary fund unfortunately Bristol's not eligible for that funding because you it's money that you borrow and we're at our debt capacity um, yeah, as a matter of fact, just yesterday we had a state meeting uh, with our Small and Rural Schools Coalition where we're working with Southwest, Southwest Virginia's legislators to introduce legislation that, for example, the literary fund, you get on the waiting list and, you, you know, you, based on need and how long you've been on the waiting list, you can get that funding if you're eligible to borrow. We're not. But there's only 13 school divisions that are currently on that waiting list and several of those have already went and got financing elsewhere. So that literary fund really helps a small number of school divisions. And so we're, we're going to be recommending legislation this up, upcoming cycle that instead of putting that money into uh, the literary fund, that you put it out there to help localities who come up with unique or um, alternative financing models or who have public-private partnerships. Uh, because here's what we know. Loca there's, Bristol's not the only locality across the Commonwealth. As a matter of fact, across the country, school facilities were in a crisis. And localities, obviously, do not have the capacity to take care of it by themselves. Our Commonwealth, there's billions of dollars worth of school uh, facility needs across our Commonwealth. The state doesn't have the capacity to do that. So it's going to take a little bit of everybody. It's going to take the state chipping in. It's going to take our localities chipping in. But it's also going to take partnerships that, are, that happen through public-private uh, collaboration and so we're recommending that those public-private collaborations be incentivized. Now, recommending it and happening and, and having money in the bank are completely different things. But um, you know, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of it. If, is the conversation consistent? Is it getting more consistent? Is the discussion about school funding needs from the state getting more pressure on the legislators because? The state can't ignore it. I mean, it, it's not just Bristol. It's it's St. Paul. It's it's it Buchanan is. County. It's everywhere. I mean, it's uh, you look around. They're just everything's getting old. I mean, it's just been around, and then, and they're going to have to do something. They just can't ignore it. So the state's going to have to continue to hear the message. Yeah, <laughs> we're of, bringing. It. And they can't say, well, we don't have you know we don't have this, we don't have that. Well, they're going to have to figure it out, right? right? Earmark more lottery funds. You know, earmark stuff because, you know, it, it's is it a priority for the state to educate? You know the citizens of the state or not you know what's their priority yeah. state police education you know what, what's their priority they got to figure that out and they can't throw it at things that's not a priority so um, I don't think they've ever had that discussion about schools well they, they actually had it this last session Senator Stanley had some legislation out there to use the Wayfair the new money coming from Wayfair sales tax uh, to and put that towards school construction to help offset the billions of dollars of needs the city the state has that was not approved. Uh, I think there'll be much more legislation come up because it's it's not just a Bristol issue. Now, you, you can look at a recent Roanoke Times about six months ago in the middle of the session, a Roanoke Times article that talked about the condition of school facilities across the Commonwealth. And they ranked the you know localities by the age of the buildings that they have. And Bristol's buildings were in the bottom third as far as age goes because we have the oldest, we're in the top third, I guess, of the oldest buildings across the Commonwealth. But we're not alone in that. You know, there's, you know, 
132 school divisions, 300 and some high schools, and then you multiply that. So yes, there is talk there, but you know, until there's legislation that, or budget amendments that occur, there's, there's no money. There. When's the last time they sent, they sent a million dollars to the city for school? So when, when's the last time that's yep, happened? I, so in 2009, we received four hundred thousand dollars for school capital needs. Two thousand what? No, two thousand and nine. Ten 2009, years ago. Two thousand nine. Ten yeah. years ago, they sent us four hundred thousand. Yeah. And and so you take that 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 has been my point as I speak in Richmond or, or, or speak to our, our colleagues who are in in our coalition. Had we had four hundred thousand dollars from two thousand nine till now, now we're talking about four million dollars that we could have invested into our facilities or to put into a fund to, you know, a down payment on a new school. But when the recession hit, those monies went away. And you know, the other part of our recommendation that we made yesterday um, was that we return to the school construction grants. You know, it's great to. Have, I mean, the literary fund helps a lot of school divisions as well, and we certainly don't want to quit funding the literary fund. But the school construction grants is another option that the state has not used in a while. We're asking them that they refund that, and they're also asking that we look at incentives to help localities like Bristol. We're not the only one. Petersburg, uh, they, have their, they have facility needs as well. Virginia Beach, there was a big article in the pilot about Virginia Beach school needs maybe last week. Um, it's a need across the state, and we can't continue to do what we've done for the last 10 years because the last 10 years it's been zero from the state and we can't even continue what we were doing before that because even at, you know even with four hundred thousand dollars you're still that's a long road to hoe. All right any other questions? I have a question for you. I'm gonna ask you a, a tough direct question. Absolutely. Okay you ready? I'm ready. If we said up here specifically talking about a new elementary school. If we said, go do whatever's best, if money's no object, not what's cheapest, do what's best. Best for our kids, best for our teachers, best for our parents. How many schools would we have and, and where? So thanks for that very tough question. That's, it's really not that tough. You know, we brought the plan to move uh, our elementary schools to the Van Pelt cap campus with a primary and elementary school because we were tasked with coming up with the budget neutral option. That is the budget neutral option. Is it the best option for our city? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, their small community schools are definitely great options. However, you can get too small. You know, when you look at economies of scale, as a matter of fact, I was looking over an old video, Mr. Mayor, in February of 2017, you said we can't continue to fund these small buildings, we you know consolidate something like this. Consolidation is what we have to start looking at, and so really, ideally, the what we what I think would be the best situation is we're continuing to do the renovations. And if you haven't come by, you need to come by Van Pelt because our guys are making a gr some great progress. It's going to be safer, and it's going to be a better learning environment for our kids. Um, and then Stonewall Jackson, out, everybody that's looked at our schools from the outside have said that Stonewall Jackson is the better of the three when you look at. Stonewall Jackson, Highland View, and Washington Lee. But also everybody has said that Washington Lee needs to close as soon as possible and Highland View should have closed many years ago. And so in my opinion, this, this is not our board's opinion, this is mine, I think many would agree, is that if you could do renovations to Stonewall and do renovations of Van Pelt, which we're currently doing with our, our current appropriation, and then you build a new school that would serve the communities of Washington Lee and Highland View, which would make a, a school of about 430, that would be what's best. We didn't bring that option to you this past November because we, you know, we, that will not be a budget neutral option. That would be, you know, we would have to have an increased appropriation for that to happen. If you'd asked us to bring the best option, that's probably what we would have brought. Now, the problem with that is find a parcel of land, you saw the map earlier, of parcels of land that are five or ten acres. Well, they're on the eastern side and there's a couple on the western side of the city. But if you look in the central, central side of the city, there's, there, there's property that's not available. Now, we're continuing to dig. As a matter of fact, I have a meeting with a landowner next week. I had a meeting two weeks ago with another landowner. Um, you know, we're continuing to talk to folks to look at different options. I never have a short answer, I know. But three schools. Renovate Stonewall, renovate Van Pelt, and build a new school for Highland View and Washington Lee. That's the best option. The most financially responsible option, 
the one that our city can afford without a, an appropriation increase last November, I don't know where we are now with interest rates and, and construction costs, would be a primary school at um, Van Pelt and an element, and a intermediate school at Van Pelt. You can build a new school at Highland View on that property. You, and I know you can do it because the state doesn't require a minimum on the acreage. There's a recommendation. If there's enough property there, that, that softball field can go somewhere else. You can build it, grade it, build it down there, have a brand new community school, and then, and then once it's built, you just you know bulldoze Highland View, right? So that could be your option, right? I would agree it could be your option. the other one that I, I don't think we've talked about is, you know, the, the whole Eastern Little League and that whole property on the other side of the creek, that whole, the city owns all that. Right. Right. Yeah. The it, hill it, behind it, there. It's very rocky. Uh, the little league and the little league folks will kill me. But you know what? Yeah. We got two little yeah. leagues. Well, we don't need two little leagues. I'm yeah. sorry. You know, we did. We did 30 years ago, 40 years ago, because yeah. we had the kids playing. We don't now. They got central can handle it all. So you got another option right there for the city long term. Is that is that whole property including the ball field? Yeah, there's 20 right? some acres there. We yes. we looked at that property, but the the grade work that would be required, and all you have to do is drive by, and the outcropping of rocks, it's all around the. Well, edge the hillside the near near the Lehigh or Valley Drive, you're right, but you know on the back side, and then including the ball field, you know yeah. you got all that acreage, yeah. so yeah. that that may be an option for you, and then the Bell Meadows out on the other end of town, mm -hmm. if you don't want to do something with Stonewall, but. But you got, I told somebody, you, you, got a, you got a premium on land. You can't, you know, you got to have some plan on the west end of town. So you got to preserve a piece of property so you build a new school. Because eventually you'll have to do something with Stonewall. Yeah. And, and, and so, every but you school can't in the give, division. But you eventually. can't give up that property because that's going to be your next new school 35 years later. Yeah. So you got to have, you got to have almost two pieces of property on the west end that you, you know, go between and, and on the east end that you go between, you know, long term. So you build and you got one ready for you. And then you build, and you cut that one down. You got one ready for you. So that's the plan we need, and we need to we need the state somehow to get behind. I, absolutely, you know, behind we're, this we're, because I'm doing everything I can on that end. The only thing that that I would add to the conversation is currently we control our own destiny. There's going to come a time if we don't take care of our accessibility issues that the Department of Justice is going to control our destiny. And we, we, so we need to be making those decisions that are best for us instead of having somebody come in, you know, from Washington or, where, or Richmond or wherever and saying, well, this is what you have to do. Well, you could get the city manager right now and get up there with people and start putting in uh, ADA accessible bathrooms. You, we could have a crew up there starting Monday morning yeah. and we could start, we could start cutting the yeah. walls out and we could modify, you know, and, and get the engineering approval and permits to do that. So it's just a matter we got to do it. You know, if we got to do it, we got to do it. We got to say we got to do it. Get the resources. I mean, it's not like we don't have any money. Okay, there, there's money, and if we got to do that, we got to do it. So let's do it. Stop. You know, let's stop making some excuses and let's do it. Dude, we're move we're on. ready. <laughs> well, can can I can I can you give us an update? I mean, we did appropriate 100,000 this year with the intent of, of an additional 100,000 for vestibules yeah. and restrooms at the elementary schools. I mean, is is that that should, I know you we're, talked about what's our, going on at Van Pelt, but. Right, our, yeah, we're, you know, you've got, your architects have to draw the designs and then they have to take those designs and get them out for RFP, which is, that's where the designs have been drawn and we're in the process of getting the RFPs. Just, just to give you an example though, you know, you put $100,000 out of this budget and $100,000 out of next year's budget to take care of those two projects. Well, just the architectural fees, for the uh, vestibules is going to be over thirty thousand dollars just for the architectural fees, and so anyway, so we are in the process of doing that, and um, once we get the RFPs and we get our bids, we're going to start construction. We anticipate that those projects will be done in November; they won't be done this summer. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Good discussion. All right, let's move on to item seven. Any more discussion? We'll move on to closed session. Consider closed session pursuant to 2.2.37.11.A1, Code of Virginia 1950 as amended. Discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, and employees of public body, parentheses, personnel. And also discussion concerning prospective business or industry for the expansion of existing business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the business or industry's interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community, per Virginia Code 2.2.3711A5. Need a motion and a second. Move that we enter in a closed session for the reasons stated. I second. 
right, get a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. Council members certify that only business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and specify the motion convened the executive session were discussed. Please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mumpower? Yes. All right, consent agenda. What's the pleasure of council? Move, Move to, to approve. approve as presented. Second. Okay, got a motion, Mr. Wingard. Second, Mr. Osborne. Any discussion? All right, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. Hartley? Yes. Osborne? Yes. Wingard? Yes. Mompower? Yes. Goodbye, adjourned. Mm -hmm.